we're going to begin this webinar right now. It's now exactly seven o'clock and we expect others to join us as they can. Um, my name is Marilyn Bardet and I'm a founding member of the Good Neighbor Steering Committee and I will be serving as host tonight for this evening's GNSC Candidates Forum. I welcome each of our candidates for mayor, Christina Strawbridge and Steve Young, and for city council, Tom Campbell, Trevor McKenzie, and Terry Scott. And I welcome the public attending, all of you who take a great interest in our town. Thank you all for your participation. This forum was created independently by the Good Neighbor Steering Committee without any financial donation or other support from any outside source, individual, commercial, or corporate. First, a word or two about the Good Neighbor Steering Committee's long history as a citizens, citizens environmental watch group. A number of us founded the original group in 2000 when Valero purchased the Benicia refinery from ExxonMobil. Of that momentous ownership change, we said then, a cloud of uncertainty is hanging over Benicia. We feel this uncertainty hanging over us now, 20 years later. Over 20 active years, our credibility has been earned by our persistent commitment to fact-finding and asking pertinent questions and to evidence-based persuasion and advocacy on behalf of the community for public health and safety and for a healthy environment. We've met many challenges. For the record, over the years, our members have participated in establishing the city's first Benicia Community Sustainability Commission, as well as the city's Climate Action Plan. In 2003, we commented and legally challenged the EIR for the refinery's decades-long Valero Improvement Project, we refer to as VIP. In 2009, when Valero proposed further changes to their facility under the EIR, we went to bat to challenge their EIR addendum on procedural as well as substantive grounds. As a result, with pro bono legal counsel provided by local land use attorney Dana Dean, we negotiated a settlement agreement with Valero that provided approximately $14 million for environmental projects that support water and energy savings benefiting both the city and the community. In 2010, the city of Benicia became a party to the amended agreement, at which time, with dedicated settlement funds, the closed Mills Elementary School was transformed into Benicia Community Center. GNSC members have addressed various major planning and development proposals. From 2013 to 2016, we actively participated with Benicians for a Safe and Healthy Community to challenge and defeat Valero's proposed crude by rail project. Most recently, we initiated a second amendment to the settlement agreement that as adopted, reallocated $1.4 million to four major projects selected by the GNSC for funding, including the Benicia Community Air Monitoring Program for which a nonprofit has recently been established. This is the first time though, that we're attempting for the sake of public education to host a candidates forum to spotlight certain issues of concern to the public regarding the future of our city, climate change and the city's and community's relationship to the refinery. I'm gonna go over the protocols for the webinar. The webinar format we've cho chosen will not include interaction with the viewing audience or with me. This is not a debate. We've asked candidates to frame their answers to stand alone, representing their own thoughts on a topic. A candidate may refer to another's response, but not in the form of a rebuttal or rejoinder to anyone else's comments. As host, I will ask each candidate to respond to each question with an order established alphabetically. We will begin with mayoral candidates first, and council candidates second. To be fair, I will rotate the order so that with each question posed, a different candidate will go first. All questions were drafted by the GNSC. All candidates and only the candidates were sent the questions in advance with background information for context. This was done to allow the candidates to study 
and prepare for tonight's forum. In the interest of time, I will not be reading the background info provided, but I will be announcing the topic areas for each question. Each candidate will have up to three minutes to answer, and our co-host, Constance Butel, will be monitoring the time. She will be either raising a sign or saying three, 30 seconds, please. The GNSC members and the webinar attendees will appreciate succinct and clear answers. We hope this evening's forum will be educational for the candidates and the viewing public alike. For the public's benefit, because we are especially concerned in this forum to discuss the city's and community's health, safety, and our future in relation to the Valero refinery, we thought it important and appropriate to remind candidates of the conflict of interest rules and advisories under the Political Reform Act dated August 2015 that is under jurisdiction of the State of California's Fair Political Practices Commission. I'm sure you're all aware. The Political Reform Act is for public interest. The po uh, Political Reform Act applies to all elected appointed officials and employees working for government at every level. The act states, and I quote, in order to prevent a conflict of interest, a public official should, one, identify and fully disclose the final financial interests that may cause a conflict, two, understand the different types of financial interests that may be the basis for a conflict, and three, consider whether the decision's effect on the off, uh, official's financial interest is reasonably foreseeable and material. The act details these precautions. According to the FPPC, the act relies, and I, I think this is important, the act relies on individual citizens to monitor the decision-making of the elected and appointed representatives to identify whether they have a conflict of interest with respect to a specific decision. Much of the enforcement of the act's conflict of interest provision is based on citizens' complaints. In other words, it, you know, uh, these are things that in, um, I would say help democracy, help people to be paying attention to their electeds. If elected, a key question is whether you would declare any conflict of interest, including perceived conflict of interest in any decision making that would specifically involve the Valero refinery, the public needs to know. And I'm not posing that question to any of you. I'm just stating that that is of interest. Topic area one, air quality and PM 2.5, and that's particulate matter at 2.5 microns, or let's say PM 2.5 or less, smaller. So here's question number one, and the first question goes to Christina. Because acute and chronic exposure to PM 2.5 is a serious health risk, especially for children with developing lungs, the elderly, and people with pre-existing health conditions, what responsibility will you take as an elected official to ensure that Venetians are well informed of the multiple health risks associated to chronic exposures to toxic air pollution, including PM 2.5? First thing I want to talk about is exactly why is a 2.5 micron particle dangerous? And it's really pretty straightforward. You know, we don't have any protection. This is a human. As far as it goes, it goes through our nose without any problem. Sinuses can't stop it. Gets into our lungs, it can't stop it. The cell in our lungs can't stop it. And it, could go, and it does go straight into our blood system. And that right off the bat is the problem. We have basically not evolved a way to protect ourselves from this kind of uh, potential assault on us. And it's also, because it's so small, it can create odd interactions with other chemicals, other organic chemicals. And as a result, you do not know what you're inhaling. When you inhale it, you think, well, it's a little piece of dust or a little piece of from a fire that is just soot it is not necessarily that case. It could be any number of little chemical cocktails which you are inhaling with each one of these particles. So it is incredibly risky things when you're talking about 2.5 micron particles. And we have, in the last two years, we've had these horrendous fires. The recent you know, record was 14 continuous days of spare the air. Well, we just shattered it. It was 30 days, 30 days, more than double that over the last you know, month. So it's highly dangerous. 
Now, I heard brought up uh, Purple Air. I love these Purple Air monitors. I bought one of these things. I think they're the greatest thing in the world. One of the things which you know should be considered because we're trying to get information out to the public about these hazards that you can't really see, you can't smell, and they're incredibly dangerous, is maybe the Good Neighbor Steering Committee should take a little bit of that money they have and subsidize uh, a number of purple air monitors being bought in the city. They're already all over the city, but you need to nail them down to neighborhoods so that neighborhoods know what they have. Like for example, today, the readings were over 170. That's hazardous air. If it gets over 200, that's hazardous air to everybody over 24 hour period. And you need to get this information out. And the best way to get the information out is to you know, various forms of community air monitors. Purple air is one. You know, the air monitors that also pick up all the other organic compounds need to be embedded in our community. And that's another, you know, source of ways, you know, to get the information out there. This is something that needs to be- 30 seconds. Okay, this is something which really, really needs to be brought forward and now, you know, so, not just particle monitors, but also monitors to check for various chemicals that we breathe. The city of Benicia and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, which we refer to as BAQMD, involving community air monitoring and public health concerns. And uh, um, a question about Valero's property tax assessment, right? Um, we're giving everybody five minutes because there are four parts and what I'm going to do is read each part to you separately so that we can distinguish between these parts. Is everybody in agreement with that? <laughs> As an elected official, what actions would you take to ensure that the City Valero Cooperation Agreement's terms are fulfilled for better communication? Well, um, actually it's getting on toward two years. It was uh, February 19, 2019, which about year and three quarters down the road, time flies when you're having fun, I guess, when we actually did this agreement. And I do what I do on everything. I never forget what's going on. So I called up, for example, B Camp a couple of weeks ago and said, what's going on with the air monitors? What's the Good Neighbor Steering Committee doing with the air monitors? And I was hoping to have a better response from them than you basically haven't spent much of the $460,000 and all you've done is moved a 20 year old air monitor over to an area next to the refinery. That's not where I want to find community air monitors. Same problem uh, as with what's happening with the air board. They haven't produced either. And the school district, why in the world would the school district not want a community air monitor next to a school? That is where you'd exactly want it. And the idea that the freeway makes any difference, it's not that the freeway is part of the air pollution that's produced. And, you know, the other thing about it, the reason these community air monitors are so important in this settlement and they should be in place is because everyone is fixated on Bolero, but you've got to remember the air patterns that are going on right now. Our biggest concern is really coming from Redale and it's coming from Richmond. It's coming from the Phillips 66 and the Chevron plants because we're dead center in the crosshairs of the stuff which comes from there. And they, especially Richmond, has had some very serious incidents. 1999, they had an incident where hundreds of people wound up going to the hospital. So what I do is I remind everybody, and I don't play favorites on what's being done. I expect things to be done after they've been written and put reduced to writing, as they say right there. So that's what I do. I do it with Valero. I do it with you guys. And I do it with the city. I do it with everybody saying, what is being done? And I expect we should be having audits annually. We should be having updates annually. So that's what There's I no requirement. Well, I won't respond, but um, the, you've brought up some very interesting questions. Would you consider appointing a council member to attend occasional BAQMD meetings and or Air District 
committee meetings that are pertinent to- I would love to do that, council member. Uh, everyone seems to have forgotten. We had a study session about a year and a quarter ago where the air board came in and I, um, I asked them some very basic questions about what are they doing? Why isn't there an air monitor in the city? And when are you going to put one in? And so I would love to be able to continue to ask those kind of questions. I like to make people uncomfortable when they don't produce results. And so I would love to be going to one of those things representing the city. Okay. Question? What would you do to Im uh, ensure that Valero is properly assessed for their property tax? Well, what we did the first time around when uh, you know, Steve Young was just talking about it and they said, well, we think we're worth maybe $150 million, you know, is we were part of the county's lawsuit that was brought and spent years on trying to come up with an assessed value. And so I, I have no problem doing the same thing. Again, when it comes to Valero, as far as it goes there, the county has the final say, and that is our problem. The county has the final say, but that doesn't mean we can't complain about what is happening. For example, you know, it took several years for the recent $835,000 increase in our property tax to kick in. You know, we also got $1.7 million that was accumulating over the two years before we actually reached the settlement on that. But this is something which is ongoing. There will also be more projects that are done out there and there will be more disputes. Basically, they're doing what you expect a business to do. Say, we don't think we're paying too much in property tax and we're doing what we're supposed to do. Say, we think that the property tax should be higher. We need to have a fair assessment. And so um, that's what I've done before and that's what I continue to do. Um, topic area three, the Air District's Regulation 12, Rule 15, required approved real-time fence line monitoring systems at all Bay Area refineries with reliable public reporting of raw data in real time. And we want to know about the status of Valero's compliance. So here are the questions. And we'll start with Tom Campbell. Good science requires independent validation of data. Under the City of Benicia uh, Valero Cooperation Agreement, will you commit to asking for independent validation of raw data collected from fence line monitoring systems and for access to archive data for independent third party review? And this is part two, what would you do to ensure that the amended settlement agreements requirement for installing a fourth fence line pathway system on the northwest side of the refinery facing Southampton neighborhoods is accomplished and that the system is reliab reliably operating. Time to start? Yes, okay. thank you. Yeah. All, right. All right, well, of those seven college degrees I have, five of them are on the basic sciences and life sciences in the first two were a bachelor's and master's degree in chemistry from the University of California. So this is something I know really well because this is what I did when I was chemist. And this is what you have to do when you're trying to decide whether raw data is good or not. The basic underlying problem you have to have is, is the calibration of the equipment correct? So what you have to do is every year, you have to have someone go in there and see if, in fact, the raw data you're getting is coming from a properly calibrated piece of equipment. If it is, then the data we're getting is data which can be read by just about anybody. And that's just by looking at the data you get, it tells you what percent of the air had, say, benzene in it. Well, that's, that's something as long as you know that the piece of machinery you're using is giving you the right number, you can tell right there and then you can go to a table and you can say it's above it or below it. So the issue is not really independence 
as far as you know, looking at the raw data, it's independence as far as looking at the machinery that's working. And yes, I think there should be, you know, every year, someone going out, checking to make sure the machinery is working properly. That generally would be something that the air district would do. So that being the case, you know, I have no problem with that at all. It's just, you have to remember what you're looking for. It's not, is the raw data correct in and of itself, it's, it's the machinery that's producing the raw data that is working properly. You raise a good point um, w that could be discussed with some experts, yes. Also, what would you do in to ensure that the amended settlement agreement's requirement for installing the fourth fence line that was part of the agreement, the amended agreement, um, is accomplished and that the system is reliably operating, installed and operating? Well, you have to say after both Valero and also the air, air district, what apparently has happened was the, uh, just what I was saying, the technology is not there yet to identify hydrogen sulfide in the low enough levels that you know they're asking for. I guess the problem probably is the UV absorption spectroscopy that's used to do it you know, can't differentiate between ambient hydrogen sulfide and sulfide coming from the refinery. The uh, error district has said, okay, everything's on hold. 30 seconds. Until we have that uh, capability. So they put it out to 2021. The thing you can't do is let it just sort of slip into, you know, the background. You have to stay on it. Where are we? When are we going to have this? you know, a capability, and once you have the capability, then you put in the, the fourth, you know, line of uh, line monitors. The Port of Benicia's contributions to greenhouse gases and toxic emissions, and the status of the reductions of those emissions to date, and the City of Benicia's Climate Action Plan, which, in my opinion, uh, this is to add one little tidbit here, needs updating. <laughs> And um, so I'll get to the question. The public has a right to know the current level of greenhouse gas emissions and reductions achieved by Valero and the Port of Benicia. As called for under the Climate Action Plan, what will you do to encourage further emissions reductions, including greenhouse gases, at the Valero refinery, including its port terminal operations and asphalt plant, as well as to encourage reduction of emissions resulting from Amport shipping activity at the Port of Benicia. I first want to just say, damn you, Steve Young, damn you. You know, that was exactly what I wanted to talk about. You know, <laughs> was, you know, it, every time, you know, you, you bring up tankers in Amports, the next line coming from the other side is, well, we've got the Commerce Clause and the Export um, Import Clause, don't go near us. And so the problem is, those tankers are really dirty. And what uh, actually Steve was talking about is one of the reasons they get away with it. They're out at sea all the time. So, you know, the tankers are stealing all this stuff out, but it's picked up by the air and by the ocean 